What's up, Badger fans? Let's talk numbers. What is actually wrong with this defense? Let's dive a little into Corral. Let's talk more about the impact, especially defensively, that missing Kamari McGee has. We got a great guest. Let's talk about it on Wisconsin. Let's go. You are Locked On Badgers, your daily podcast on the Wisconsin Badgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, Badger fans? Welcome to Locked On Badgers, your team every single day. Thank you so, so much for tuning in. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Herrings. Uh, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Uh, right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. Uh, let's bring on Austin from Guard Your Fickle, writes at Badger Notes. Super, super great follow on Twitter. Basketball analytics during the game at timeouts. Um, I follow him because I get smarter doing it. So as always, man, making your a re- repeat visit to the show. Yeah. Um, I wish it was. I wish it was coming off like a, a, a even a solid February. Forget like a great February. I wish it was coming off a, a an okay February, bro. That's the that's the worst February ever. Yeah, that was that's tough. That's tough, uh, yeah. and, and we're all feeling it right now. That's for sure. Listen, I want to start here because this. I feel like. The issue with this team is defense. I mean, I, I the issue is defense. Um, where, how is this team falling off a cliff? Like, what do the numbers say about this team's defense right now? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you look at Ken Palm, and he's still got us as like a top seventy-five defense. Um, Torvik and and Haslam metrics, I think, have us pretty highly too. I don't. I've got us ranked now one hundred and fifty-second. Um, in defensive efficiency, just based on, you know, my model. Um, and so what goes really quick, I want to pause as much as you're willing to divulge and whatnot, but like, what goes into your model? How do you, how do you get to where you're at? Yeah. So I, I really track, um, three, three metrics defensively. Um, so it's a net of turnover, effective field goal percentage given up, right? So how, like, are you giving up a lot of threes and do you turn, turn them over? at a high percentage and kind of coupling those together in, in one kind of possession metric. And then um, I take into account your defensive rebounding ability um, into kind of a defensive efficiency stop factor is what I call it. So essentially you take the, your net of turnover effective field goal percentage given up. So, and then you uh, take that divided by your defensive rebounding percentage. And that gives you um, this stop factor metric that I call it. Um, and then just your the amount of free throws that you give up. Um, and so kind of all of those coupled together, you kind of regress that over, um, the points, um, that all of college basketball gives up, you know, each team's inputs into those. And then you can kind of get a sense of, um, as you're trending in those metrics through your season, um, what, what your defensive efficiency is. It's a pretty similar thing that Kempom's doing. Um, probably just, um, you know, what are those particular factors? Um, you know, when you go on his site, um, if you, if you subscribe to it, um, he's really big into the Dean Oliver four factors, right? So effective field goal percentage, um, rebounding percentage, turnovers and free throw attempt rate. So I'm kind of using all of those as well, just kind of, I, I pair them up a little bit differently. So instead of, effective field goal percentage and turnovers as kind of two separate things. I combine them into one um, as, as my metric and then uh, the, the rebound stuff kind of coupling that together. So there's, there's some differences, but most of the, you know, the secret sauce is all, all the same. Yeah. I love it. I absolutely love it. And like you said, it spiraled, right? Cause this was, and we were talking yeah. about fair in your, in your, in your metrics is top, 70 ish defense. Yeah. Um, they were on January 31st, right? Coming off of whatever win that was. Um, I think it was Michigan State. Was Michigan State, yeah. Michigan State, yeah. We were, you know, top 11 in offensive efficiency and number 66. And right now, our offense is still really good. I know some people have been questioning that, uh, but our offense is 16th in my rankings and top 20 in pretty much all the other advanced metrics. But I've got us down to 152nd in defensive efficiency, just absolutely brutal. Um, and you look at most of the games, um, kind of Providence and Arizona, are, are, I would say are kind of outliers because if you look at 
we we didn't really score the ball very well in those games either. But in every loss, it's all been based on our defensive efficiency, just giving up way too many points um, than we've been able to score. And and through January, we were able to outscore it. And I, just as it's gotten progressively worse, and we can get into how Kamari Agi kind of affects that um, with him being out, but it's really fallen off a cliff as of late. Well, let's start there because I – a lot of people have been talking about Kamari McGee and almost the hidden loss. Nobody, nobody expected Kamari McGee to be the rock that knocked the train off the rails, right? But, And I'm not saying he is. I think that's probably a little overblown. But defensively, what do the numbers say about McGee when he's on the court? And how, how much can we read into that? Because that is a smaller sample yeah. size. Yeah, so uh, if you look at just kind of the raw on-off splits, um, and I'm using CBB Analytics, which is kind of another – advanced um, data site uh, that you can go to. Great stuff there. Uh, when he's on the court, our defensive rating um, is 18.3 points per 100 possessions better when he's That's on the court, wild. which is insane. Now, this is raw numbers, right? So there's, um, if you think about um, kind of advanced analytic metrics, like you have to think about who's on the court with with him and who on the opposing team is on the court with, when he's on the court. So there's, you know, some some noise in in that data point. But um, and you know he's only played 123 three minutes um, on the season. So pretty limited sample size. But from what that allows guard to do from giving Chucky you know strategic rests and just right sizing you know Klesman's minutes and. Um, just overall, our guard depth becomes exponentially better um, with with those guys, you know, being more effective um, on their in their time on the court. It's just huge. Um, and again, it was kind of hidden because the guys only playing six, seven minutes a game. How, how big could that be? Well, it's kind of a snowball effect. Well, it's, it that raises two quick thoughts in my head. The first is. Geez, maybe maybe that dude should be getting, and that dude, Kamari McGee should be getting twelve minutes a game, right? Maybe it's it's hard, right? Because Hepburn's gonna got got to get 30, 32, but perhaps there's there's a case here where that 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 is either proven true through more minutes, and we're like, this guy is a defensive dynamo that changes the dynamics of the game. Uh, better against the pick and roll, better against quicker guards. Let's get him a few more minutes, and you can stagger that between Klesman, Hepburn, whatever. It also kind of paints a picture for McGee. Still got a couple of years in Madison. You know, like that's right. So he came over, he did one year as a freshman, sophomore. He's got two more years. I mean, that's an optimistic thing to look at. If this is, you look at what he was last year to what he is this year. Um, there, There's a backup guard there for the next couple of years, which I think Badger fans can feel pretty confident in. And I think that's a win that nobody was counting on at the beginning of this year with McGee. Yeah, no, I mean, in the way he plays and, and how he, and it's not just defensive. I think he's, he's very effective at running the offense and kind of getting us, into our sets, similar to how how Chucky is. I, I don't think he's not nearly as dynamic a playmaker and, and shot maker, but everything you'd want out of a backup point guard, Kamari McGee is. Um, so it's a big, it's been a big loss. Let's talk a little bit about uh, continue talking defense because I think that's then as we talked about, which really led to this this um, slow February, this bad February, uh, pick and roll defense. Um, obviously, that's something Indiana exploited. Other teams have hurt the Badgers there. Uh, what have you seen from the pick and roll defense? What frustrates you about it? Is that on the coaches? Is that on the players? Obviously, it's it, there's elements of both, but where do you fall on that one? Yeah, well, they try to play. So the guard scheme and has been, I think, even back to Bo Ryan, is to kind of play this sort of drop coverage, right? So the, the big man, um, the, the screeners guy, kind of sits back all the way into the lane and kind of forces the, the guard coming off the screen into kind of a no man's land situation. Now that only works when the the ball handler's uh, defender gets over the top of the screen and gets back into the play very quickly. That's been where the breakdown has happened pretty much all year um, is those guards are just getting caught up in those screens and getting completely washed out of the play. And so that's put Crowell in, in winter into a, a really, really tough spot where they're playing one on two. Um, now the drop coverage principle would be to protect the hoop 
um, and really force that point guard into a lot of mid range or mid range jump or floaters and mid range jumper pull ups. The problem with and the breakdowns that happened last night and have happened um, get here and there over the course of the season is they're stepping up too much, right? And that allows a lot more space um, for those lobs and, and dump down passes um, that clearly where just ate us up uh, on Tuesday. And so that, that's really the breakdown is we're we're struggling to get over the top, and that's really feeding into a lot of downstream issues. All right. We take a quick break for new friends of the show. I want to come back and ask Austin Gardner Fickle a little bit about adjustments that he would like to see to that coverage, if anything. Um, and then we're still going to get into Stephen Krell, talk about Illinois coming up a little bit, a lot more to go on this show. But first, a quick break for our new friends of the show. Um, and I'm excited about this one. Our new friends of the show over at Nissan. Listen, are you the kind of driver that likes to push things just a little further? I am. That That's all me. Um, you ever wonder what adventure could be like around the next corner? I do that all the time. Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives, great escapes, everything you want for that growing modern family. Class exclusive Google built-in is always updating uh, your assistant on whatever you need. So you have a personal assistant in the car. Gone are the days of connecting your phone, trying to drive while you're trying to find locked on badgers on your podcast while you're driving. All that's gone. The Rogue has you covered. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. They also have the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder room up to eight. That's a basketball team and three dudes on the bench. I mean, that's that's all you need right there. Expansive cargo capacity, advanced capable, four by four drive. It is all there, 284 horsepower, 6,000 pounds of towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada. Go find your next big adventure. The Armada also is a rugged 4x4. Shop NissanUSA.com. Shop NissanUSA.com and have the adventure of your life for your family, for yourself, for your future. All right. Let's let's get uh, Austin back in here. Guard your fickle. Um, I want to start with where can people find your awesome work? Yeah. Uh, follow me on Twitter. So you got the handle there at guard your fickle. Um, always live tweeting the games um, with updated stats um, and just kind of, you know, the the angry thoughts um, as of late of, of what's going on, what's what's causing us issues. Um, and then over at Badger Notes. Um, so ton of great writers other than myself over there. Um, but we got you covered for everything Badger sports. We got men's uh football basketball women's basketball wrestling i mean we got we got all the coverage over there um so what whatever you're looking for from badger sports standpoint just head over to badgernotes.com absolutely i, I want to go back to the the question i kind of paused that before the break um and this is something i've talked about like i get i don't get so frustrated seeing like here's the thing occasionally teams are going to exploit something you do right is it is it frustrating yes do the players play better yes right those are are true things but there was a point where Indiana just kept exploiting it, and I was yelling at my screen to blitz the double team. In other words, basically just make that ball ball handler send both defenders at him, rotate someone weak side to cover that that roller, and then just make the ball handler do something different. Essentially, just make them do something different, right? Uh, or go under the screen. Or you you mentioned before the show we've seen them hedge it before. Was it frustrating to not see any adjustment there? And what would you like to see, kind of in that situation? Yeah, yeah, it was it was a nightmare watching that over and over again. Um, I couldn't I couldn't go to sleep. Um, but yeah, there there is a level of frustration. Um, but if I if I put myself in in guard shoes, what he's seeing out there is just a complete and utter lack of execution, right? So it's not where Indiana is doing something we haven't seen, and okay, now we need to really adjust. It's they they were running a simple high ball screen with one backside um, rise up. Right, trying to put play three on three on one side of the court, and we were just getting eaten up in the screen. And then our big was stepping up with just with that just allowed so much room um, to lob or dump down, and we weren't tagging the roller hard enough off off that backside guy. I don't know who was always in the corner. If it was um, the, the name Mbako, I don't know if I'm getting that right. Um, he's their best three point shooter. I'm not sure if they had him in the backside corner. Um, I was too busy watching where just dunk it every time. Um, yeah, but yeah, there, I think there is, there is a level of, you know, once you see that four or five times, you know, is there a red or, you know, some sort of blitz call that they can in the moment say, 
you know, Chucky, I get, I just got washed up. Like, do, do they need to, to come out hard and, and really just try to blow up the play and see if we can reset in a scramble situation or something along those lines. Um, but to just watch that six, seven times in a row um, is just unacceptable, both from an execution and lack of adjustment. Yeah, I, I got to be honest. And people accuse me, like I get comments on the show like, ah, Ryan's looking for other fanboys to defend guard. And it is what it is. Everyone's got their opinions, and I'm totally for that on this show. Um, so I, I I am somebody who spends a decent amount of time being a bulwark for, for Great Guard. And I don't even really mean to, but on this one, I think it's all on Great Guard. I really do. Like think of it, think of it in like a football situation. Let's say three, four times in a row we ran a bubble screen out to Quincy Burroughs and we had Pauling blocking it every time he got blown up. Yeah. And it, it's not going to be okay if Phil Longo says, well, he just needs to block him. It's an execution thing. Now, at some point, it's not working in the game, and you got to adjust. And then and after, after after the game, break it down in practice and say, you guys were messing this up. I didn't want to adjust it, but I had to because you couldn't guard the action. Yeah, I, I, I feel that frustration, uh, and I get that. I, I think it's more of a personnel issue than it is – can you make that adjustment in the game? I mean, like Houston and Iowa State, I mean, they bull rush almost every pick and roll because they have the athletes at the four and five position to do that. And if they get stuck in a scramble situation, they're comfortable with um, Roberts or I don't even know who Iowa State's got to, to guard a, a, a quick ball handler. I don't trust Stephen Crowell um, if we get into a blitz situation and – we're 10 seconds on the shot clock and he's guarding, you know, Tyson Walker or whoever um, at the top of the key one-on-one. -on -one. I, I think that's almost as bad as um, maybe it's not, all, maybe it's not as bad as lobs to Khalil Ware, but I mean, that's definitely not a, a plus situation that you want to be living in multiple times in a game. So I think it's more of a personnel and that's something that he guard needs to just or to remedy pretty quickly. And it's got to happen um, next year, because I mean, you look down the line at Winter, Yaldon, Hodges, none of those guys are athletic enough to be multiple in how you're going to defend the pick and roll. He's he's basically recruiting to his scheme. Um, and so if you're not going to get execution, then you're going to need to to get some new guys in there. Yeah, no, that's, and that's a very good point with personnel. I think that's a, a strong perspective. The one area I'd push back a little bit is, is you're not playing – I'm trying to think of, you're not playing Steve Nash, right? You're not playing a point guard who's going to diagnose that. Like they've seen that same yeah, defense three, four times in a row. I think if you just hit him once with a, like, I think you're just going to throw him off because it's a yeah. college point guard. It's a college team, right? Yeah. And, All you need to do is stop the run. So, right. Like 100%. you just do something different, even if you're not fully equipped for it, because the alternative is just to watch a guy go 11 and 12 at the rim. Well, not yeah. Al at the rim. Obviously, he did three and some other stuff. But the point is, sometimes it's just about throwing them off balance a little bit. And I don't know if, if listen, they beat you on that great, they're beat, beating you the other way too. So, yeah, um, yeah. I want to move on because I mean that thing's been beaten to death mostly by me, and I apologize for that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit uh, about Stephen Crowell, a guy I talk about a lot in the show, a guy a lot of fans are frustrated with. Um, I'm just kicking it over to you. Where are you at on Stephen Crowell? How much of the the fan criticism from certain areas is, is warranted? How much of it do you think is maybe? more of a roster construction issue. Um, I'm curious where you're on Stephen Crowell. I, I think Stephen Crowell is one of the most underrated big men offensively, and not just in the Big Ten, but in the country. I think he's extremely dynamic in what he can give our offense, um, especially with the way we play. Um, his ability, I should say, February was a rough, rough month for him um, and just how aggressive double teams really – hampered him um, in how he usually likes to play. Um, but his ability over the course of his career to dish and also score inside and out um, is highly effective. I think it becomes, uh, to your roster construction point, when he's playing with Tyler Wall, I think things get a lot more difficult for him. Um, I think he would be much, much better um, playing with four capable outside shooters um, just with the space that that would provide him to, to operate one-on-one, -on -one, which I think he's very good and, and doesn't get uh, as much credit as, as he should for being a really good low post scorer in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, he, he does play weak at times, but that's at times. That's kind of the – that's not the rule. That's the exception to it. 
Um, but I mean, teams have been able to, especially in February, aggressively double him really strongly uh, because we got Tyler Wall out there. We got Carter Gilmore out there who posed no threat um, to shoot the ball from the outside. And so they're, they're betting that they can cover three shooters um, with three guys. And if Tyler Wall or Gilmore catches it, they're, they're okay with that. And so that really hampers his game. Um, and so he's really great offensively um, in the right situation. Defensively, I think he, he gets out muscled quite a bit, um, especially when he's got people close to um, his level of physicality and above. Um, he really likes to eat up on lower competition um, on the defensive end. And then really, I, I hadn't had too much trouble with how he's defended in the pick and roll, but um, over the last couple of weeks, and especially on Tuesday, like he's getting caught in no man's land. And it's like, I, I don't really care if your guards are getting – beat up in the screens and you don't step up because that, that completely um, destroys everything that we're trying to do um, off, off the ball screen action, right. With the three other guys, it just completely destroys it. Um, so I was, I was pretty upset with his defensive performance last night or on, on Tuesday, excuse me. Um, and a lot of the criticism he was receiving was, was warranted. I think he played a pretty, um, pretty weak game. Yeah, I agree there. That was, that was, and the thing of it, like if you end up giving like for take the, you're totally right. Take the guard out of the equation. He he got hung up on the screen. He didn't get around it. Whether it's an effort thing, whether he didn't fight enough, whatever it is. If you the worst thing you do is you give up like a little eight foot push shot floater, mm -hmm. and then you box out. Like a lot of guard guards aren't hitting that all the time. Like that's okay. Yeah. He, yeah. Where, and that and that's really the point of the the drop coverage is those are the shots you want to be forcing other opposing teams into is pull up mid range jumpers or contested floaters like guys at the college level unless you're an elite you know Cassius Winston type of point guard you're not going to be hitting those at a high rate so from an analytics perspective like that's the right from from my perspective given our personnel and all those other things the right defense we should be playing. We just got to execute and we're not doing that. And so whether, I don't know what they need to do, whether it, I think a lot of it's footwork driven um, where we're not like taking a good first step um, when the ball screen is actually getting placed. And that's really where the guard, I mean, the guards are guard has been calling for a lot of moving screens and this is off ball situation stuff, but you can see him yelling at the officials for it. it's like, you're not going to get that call when you're running into his chest and also his shoulder. Like if you're getting his shoulder and elbow, maybe I can see um, wanting that call and getting that call. But when you're running half, half the contacts into the guy's chest, you're not going to get that call. No, you're getting a moving screen call twice a game. Maybe yeah. that's it. Maybe you can't live off it. Just, like you can't live off it. You got to get around the screen, bro. Like, I don't know why I said bro there, Like, <laughs> but you got to get around the screen. <laughs> Chucky. And then, to your point, Crowell, you, you can't just get stuck in no man's land, defend the rim and make him shoot a little floater. And if he, listen, if he makes those, that's not, the, then that's not going to be on Stephen Crowell. Yeah. Fans will still hate him a little bit to some degree, but that won't be on Crowell. That's what happens. Yeah. The, the selfish thing in that position isn't to try to help your teammate out. Or I should say it's the other way around. The selfish thing to do is to help your teammate out. Um, the unselfish thing is to stick to your principles yeah. because that's, that's how all the, the rest of the defense is, is built on. And um, he, he was, he was trying to be a quote unquote, good teammate trying to bail his, his buddy out who got, who's getting caught up in the screens all night. And that just really killed us. Now we're going to take one more quick break, come back with Austin. I want to ask him about the, the over under on this Illinois game coming up. One eighty question mark. I don't know. We're going to talk about that next on Locked On Badgers. But first, a quick break for our good friends of the show over at FanDuel. FanDuel remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs and information. Everything you want to do from a futures, parlays, teasers, spreads, baseball, basketball, golf. It's all there. Even the sports that, listen, sometimes you just want to throw some money on somebody you've never heard of in a sport you never follow and just see what happens. See what windfall comes out of that. Do it responsibly, but you can do that over at FanDuel. FanDuel.com slash locked on. New customers bet $5, get $150 in bonus bets. I'm looking to bounce back from my my not so great bet on the Badgers money line against Indiana. I'm sneaky confident 
I don't know why. I probably shouldn't be. I think the Badgers are going to beat Illinois. I, I, I do. I, I don't understand why. I just think they play better at home. And I'm curious on that over under. I'm probably just going to have money on the over almost no matter what it is. Uh, just because we've seen us play defense. We've seen Illinois play offense. We've seen Illinois play defense. There's some issues there. Um, so go over to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. Great new offer. FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. The official sports betting uh, partner of the LockedOn Network of Major League, uh, the NFL, and of the NBA. All right, let's get uh, Austin back on. Austin, man, over under on the Illinois-Wisconsin game coming up. Yeah, what, what is – do you have the line? I don't. I'm, I'm curious okay. what you think it would be. Yeah, well, my model's got um, – well, I should – preview's coming out tomorrow, but I'll, I'll – 84 for your audience. We'll, we'll give, uh, give a taste. Uh, so I got Illinois at 84.37 and Wisconsin at 77.96. So that's what? 161, 162. Um, so if, and that's, that's at 69 possessions projected out. I was trying to look to see what, uh, what I don't see it played. I don't see it out yet, at. which makes sense, but. So you, you you actually I feel like you have it a little lower than um, I think the the, the knee jerk reaction would be. I mean we just saw the yeah. the um, Illinois Minnesota game that was just played yesterday. If you're catching this show, it, Illinois scored 100 plus, gave up around 90 to Minnesota. I don't remember the exact score. We've seen Wisconsin play defense for a, a while. It's been a bit of a struggle. We know Wisconsin mm-hmm. can score. Um, I think I would take the over on on your over. What, what would you go on that one? Yeah, I I don't know how. I think there there may be some bias in the, that Minnesota game. I I don't know how fast Minnesota plays, um, but we're we're pretty a, a good chunk below the NCAA average, mm-hmm. and I think in in a lot of ways we we control the pace pretty well. Um, so if if that number was one one sixty, I'd probably take the over. I think there's probably a good chance, just given how bad both these defenses are, that there's going to be uh, a lot of points scored. What are your thoughts going into this game? I, I know you talked a little bit about what your model, the, the score, I think mm-hmm. you said it was 84-77? 84-77, yeah. What, so, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, I, I'm extremely worried about our, our uh, ability to guard dribble penetration. Um, I think Shannon Jr. and um, Domask, I think, are going to be able to get in into the lane quite a bit. Um, and then I think we haven't really seen a team do that. And then also kick out, um, two shooters. If they, if we start collapsing in Hawkins, um, and the goody, I don't, I don't know, um, who their other sh- shooter is, what his name is off the top of my head, but they're really good. Um, so I think things could spiral for us pretty quickly. Um, and then they also, uh, attack the, the O boards really well. Um, my, my models got them as the sixth best um, adjusted offensive rebounding team in the country. Um, and so they're going to crash it hard. So even if they are, um, they're not shooting it that great. I think there's going to be a lot of second chance opportunities for them, even though we're, we're also a really strong defensive rebounding team. That, that That's the one thing defensively that we can kind of hang our hat on, uh, which is kind of easy when, you know, every bucket is, is going through the net. So um, makes, makes those opportunities a lot easier to go get. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's going to be who, who plays defense the most right there. I got them as the fifth best offense and 102nd best defense and we're 16 and 152. So it's whoever can get one, one or two stops in a row um, coming down the, the last four minutes. Um, eight to four minutes is gonna gonna probably get this one done, but um, yeah, it, I I I don't have warm and fuzzies um, about our ability to defend Illinois because they're just they're athletic and long, um, and they got multiple ball handlers, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a real challenge. Yeah, my my warm and fuzzies slowly receding after talking to you for a few minutes yeah. here. Uh, how about does playing in Madison? make a difference does your met does does, do you factor that in in any way when you're looking at your factors i do not so i don't i don't take i don't take into account home court advantage um that's probably something should look into uh for next year um i i 
I think it's been uh, an outlier season in terms of home court advantage. Um, home teams have been, especially in the Big Ten, have been really outperforming. Um, but I think there is definitely a portion of, of home cooking um, that gets involved. And then um, they're honoring, um, or I don't know if it's honoring, but for Howard Moore, um, and I think that's going to, you know, that should give the the team a, some juice, right, to, um, you know, I think it's do more, be more, for more is kind of that um, uh, their line um, to, to kind of honor him. Um, so I think there's going to be a, a certainly a level of, of edge that they're going to play with for, for Howard Moore. Um, and so they're going to need it um, for sure. I want to finish up here because we're already at 30 minutes, man. And I could talk to you for, because I, I definitely, I think not just me, we, I think we all get smarter when people like you are able to come on and talk and you have such a unique, smart perspective on it. Um, but I would be remiss if, if I didn't ask you about your, just your overall confidence in the state of the program right now, Greg Gard, um, <laughs> You know, I've said my piece a billion times, so I, I'm just going to kick it over to you and see where you're at on this. Yeah, I was actually uh, I was thinking about that um, yesterday and a little bit today, um, and I was I was actually writing some stuff down on it. But the the 2020 class um, kind of got ripped apart a little bit earlier than um, anybody was expecting with Ben Carlson and then Lauren Bowman. Um, and the unfortunate circumstances um, with him and all of the, the issues that, that he, he dealt with off the court. And, um, and then John, Johnny Davis leaving for the NBA after two years and his brother leaving a year after that. So that class was pretty much decimated. And the only thing remaining from that um, is Stephen Crowell. And then you look at the 21 class, Jacoby Neath. Um, then we got uh, Matthew Moores. He's done. Um, Ilver who and Hodges who haven't materialized into anything and then Isaac Lindsay so those two classes right there I mean he missed 80 percent of those classes and that's eight to nine scholarships there so he, he did a to caveat that um, in 2022 you know brought in a season in Klesmet, um and then last year store in Blackwell so He's he did he dug himself a hole. Greg Gard did for sure it, with the the 2020 and 2021 classes, and that's primarily the the drop off we saw in 2022 2023. We we're taking the right step um, this year. Obviously, the, the the slide in February is again. You, you hate to make excuses, but like Kamari McGee loss is is a loss and we didn't have Blackwell, Blackwell for a couple games in there too. Um, so it's hard to judge, but you look at January 31st. I mean, this was, uh, I mean, a consensus top 15 basketball team. We were number six in the country in the eight people. I think the, the overall trend is up. Um, and then you look at the, this class coming in with Fry tag and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, oh, Robeson. Ro Robeson. Right. I mean, you add Knepple or McAndrew into that list, and I like his his seat is ice cold, but he didn't get him, so yeah. it's starting to warm up. But I think the overall trajectory is back to a good status quo. Now, next year, if we're kind of in this similar spot, I think there's – I mean, I think the seat is pretty hot for Greg Gard. Now – He's already got uh, an in-state kid for the 2025 class. We'll see how that pans out. I know um, I've heard rumblings of Hannah um, not not coming our way um, and has cooled on us pretty good. So that's yet another top 25, yep. top 50 in-state guy that he's let get outside um, outside of uh, red and white. And so that's that's and another tough thing. A lot, of, a lot of effort into. It's not yeah. just a. It, 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 and it's and, and sometimes it's not even the top tier guys. It's like you look at he, he's gone and, and got the Moore's kid from uh, South Dakota or North Dakota um, and some other out of state guys. And he's let slip a lot of pretty decent in-state talent that maybe out of high school weren't power five level guys. But you look at this, the Pavletsky kid, Klesmet, um, those those are guys who 
um, went to non non power five teams and, and now are playing for power five schools. You got Klesman back, but there's, there's a number of those guys, um, Rody, um, who's now at Virginia. I mean, the, the list is pretty big of guys that he, he overlooked in state that have turned out to be pretty good players. So I think there's, there's definitely a level of recruiting that's um, kind of flowed into the roster construction issues. Um, but I think some of those have been righted, especially over the last two classes in this class. Um, that gives me a little bit more confidence um, that we're, we're trending back into, you know, 20, 20 wins, um, less than 10 losses, regular season type of performances. And, and hey, that, I mean, that's where Bo Ryan lived for pretty much all of his career, except for the, the last two, two full seasons when we went to the final four back to back years. So I, I'm not sure there's, there's a world where we ever get into the Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, blue blood, where we're winning 27 plus games a year. I, I, I just don't, that's not a realistic possibility. Um, and guard has been kind of mediocre by Wisconsin St. Bo Ryan standards um, with low 20 wins and double digit losses. But I think we're trending um, back to kind of the Bo Ryan standard. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily think his seat is hot right now. If we're 18 and 10 at this point in time in 2025, I think his seat is pretty warm, though. Yeah, I think it's a pretty fair perspective. All right, he is Austin Gardner Fickle at Gardner Fickle. Go follow him on Twitter. Go check out his work and everyone else's at Badger Notes. Like we talked to a bunch of those guys. We have several of them on the show. I talk to Dylan all the time. Um, so they do great, great, great content over there. So go check out their work. Go follow Austin. Um, as always, my friend, thank you so much for jumping on. And hopefully, this is the start of a resurgent bit of a run here. I was gonna say we. I, I hopped on before uh, the Arkansas State game, and uh, maybe the juices were were just wearing off in February. So let's nice. get this thing restarted. Let's get it going. I love it. On Wisconsin, thank you everybody for tuning in. As always.